Good morning, everyone. Bear with me as I take a drink of water here. You guys can probably already tell, but something hit me pretty hard this week. <clears throat> I'm over it in terms of the contagious sense, but whatever it was, it laid me out pretty good. Uh, so I'm going to stay away from you anyway, just to be on the safe side. So if you see me, like, not stepping up close to you to talk to you after church, it's nothing personal I'm with my mask on and stuff like that. I just don't want to share the blessing that I had. And also bear with me as I, my voice hasn't quite come up uh, to what it was yet. <clears throat> I'm not going to have you turn in the scripture right now. I'm going to put most of the passages up on the board. But if you want to get ahead, I think the one passage we're going to turn to eventually is Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. So if you want to turn there, but we're not going to be there yet. <clears throat> we're... Yes? What did I drop? Paperclip? Oh, Okay. Well, we can't have that on the floor now, can we? Thank you much, sir. Appreciate it. We're making our final push through the church membership series. Uh, we're talking about our responsibilities as members. Um, there was five of them, uh, as I had shared before, that we were going to talk about, and today we're going to be looking at the last of them, which is to represent. Um, as members of the church, it's our responsibility to faithfully represent Christ in his kingdom to the world around uh, and Je Jesus clearly, clearly excuse me, described his disciples as representatives of himself. That is to say, he clearly described us as representatives of God's kingdom. Um, and uh, one of the places we see this very clearly, this is not the only one, but this is probably one of the more famous ones, is Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, where Jesus says to his disciples, as he is sending them out to preach in pairs, he said, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Notice the words there. He who receives you receives me. Receiving you is equivalent to receiving me. Do you see the representative nature of this? And we also see in the same chapter that the opposite is also true. Matthew chapter 10, verses 14 and 15 say, Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. And so the idea here is receiving you is equal with receiving me, and rejecting you is equal with rejecting me. And so it has uh, clearly been Jesus' intention from the very beginning for his followers to represent him in this world. And uh, we see this over and over again. These are just some examples. However, Jesus was equally clear that not everyone who speaks and acts in Christ's name is actually representing him. Uh, first off, we see that we're called to represent him, but at the same time, not everyone who speaks and acts in Christ's name is necessarily representing him. And we see this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And look at this. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Isn't that interesting? We did all these things in your name. He's saying, I never knew you. Uh, there are people out there um, who are representing him. There are other people speaking his name that are not representing him in reality. Um, as Christians, we are all called to represent Christ, but not everyone speaking and acting in his name is doing so. And some of the loudest and most zealous for Christ, believe it or not, have nothing to do with him in reality. That's what he's saying here. Some of the people chanting his name the loudest and the most in reality are not connected with his kingdom at all. And that's a very sobering thought. It's something to think about as we process this. And with this in mind, this morning, I want to explore the, qu explore the question of how to represent Christ faithfully. Um, how can we tell that we are representing Christ faithfully? And what are the signs that we are actually not doing so? What are the signs that we are doing it right and what are the signs that we're doing it wrong as we seek to represent him in this world? Uh, there are two telltale signs that come to mind. Um, they are seen in the way we embrace Christ's authority and the way that we align ourselves with his identity as Messiah. Um, follow along. These are going to be our points. Um, if you don't have an outline yet, they are in the bistro tables. There's only two points, uh, but uh, they're large enough that we're, it's still going to take us the majority of our time to go through. Uh, but first, we're going to begin with embracing Christ's authority. Jesus has repeatedly emphasized our need for authority 
and for power as we represent him. Again, he repeatedly emphasizes this. We need authority and power to be able to represent him in this world. Um, and there's lots of places we can see this in the scripture. For example, the Great Commission is based upon Christ's authority. This is one of the most famous passages of scripture. Many of us know it by heart. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And there's commands involved in that beyond that, but notice he says, go therefore, go in my authority. He says, I have authority, my authority is established, go in that. The entire Great Commission is based upon authority. Um, also, Jesus gave his disciples authority before he sent them out in pairs. So these passages that I was quoting earlier from, from Matthew 10, it, it, the whole chapter is devoted uh, to Jesus taking his disciples and sending them out in pairs basically as a training mission to kind of teach them for, for, of what was going to happen in the future. And as he was sending them out in pairs, the very first thing that he did was he gave them authority. This is Matthew 10.1. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Before he did anything with them, before he sent them away, he gave them authority first. And probably the most famous example of this would be when Jesus ascended just before what he told his disciples then regarding being witnesses. Jesus instructed his disciples to stay in Jerusalem and not go until they'd received power. <coughs> we see this in Acts chapter 1. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me, heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Wait in Jerusalem, don't go yet. Uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit very soon, and then you will go. And we see in verse 8, but you will receive power. He's talking about the same thing. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and even to the, other, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Um, and so he's saying, wait, you will receive power, then go. According to Jesus, power and authority are a necessary prerequisite to representing him. This is seen over and over again in the text. And when you think about it, this actually makes quite a bit of sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you think about it just in terms of this present world and the way things are in this world, if you are going to represent someone or something, you need the authority to do so. It just logical. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is police officers. They are on the front lines representing the state and local government, uh, maintaining order and protecting people. Uh, they have authority to do that. Um, police officers are given the authority to issue fines, uh, to, um, to detain people, um, they also have authority to kind of bend the rules a little bit. It sounds like it's bad, but it's not meant to be. They can run a red light if they need to. They can do what they have to do in order to keep us safe. They have special authority that we don't have to represent the state. And that's, I would argue that if they didn't have that authority, they wouldn't be able to do their job, right? The same thing is true for us. So there's no question that we need power and authority to represent Christ. The real question is, <coughs> how do we go about getting power? No question that we need power. We need authority. I think we all agree with that. The question is, how do we go about getting power? Do we struggle and contend for worldly power against our fellow man? Or do we receive kingdom power from God directly through faith? And I'll ask that question again. Do we struggle and contend for worldly power against our fellow man? Or do we receive kingdom power from God in faith? The way we answer this question goes a long way to determining whether we're truly representing Christ or not. This is a very big indicator of whether we're doing it right or doing it wrong. So consider the following questions. Do you look to things like guns and strong, uh, tough-talking leaders and political allies and such things as that to protect our faith? Do you look to those same kind of things, guns, strong leaders, political allies, to advance the Christian faith? Do you measure Christianity's strength and weakness based upon our access to power like this and how strong our allies are in certain places in government and such things as that? If you think that way, if your answer to this question is yes, then you are at least inclined towards using worldly power to represent Christ in his kingdom. 
there's at least some inclination in there that you want to use worldly power to represent Christ and his kingdom. It's a problem. And something I'm going to bring up now is I think it's something that really isn't hard to debate. I think we've all seen it. Um, and that is that uh, over the past five to six years, perhaps longer, uh, Christianity has become much more powerful than it was uh, in our land. I, I think it's not even something we could argue now. It's become much more powerful, uh, particularly in ver- uh, uh, from 2016 to 2020. Uh, during that time, think about it for a second. We had an evangelical vice president. We had a man in the, as the vice president of the United States uh, who actually not only believed, but had a conversion testimony and everything. Um, his advisors in the cabinet, or the, uh, the cabinet advisors also were evangelicals with testimonies the same way. Ministers of the gospel were regularly brought into the White House to advise the President of the United States and to have influence on policy. And of course, we can't forget about the fact, I think this is the biggest thing of all, that during that period of time, the Supreme Court conservative majority was established, and that's going to last for decades to come. The Supreme Court is now a conservative majority, and we're already seeing the effects of that in the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which is something that has been on the agenda for Christians to do for as long as I can remember. It has just been accomplished. It is undeniable to see that Christianity, at least in the short term, has become more powerful. And we sit on the sidelines, and we have to ask ourselves the question, how is this not a win? How is this not an incredible win for Christianity right now? Well, you have to ask yourself a question. We've become more powerful, yes. But is it worldly power or kingdom power that we've gained? All right? And ask yourself the question, um, what did we have to do to get that power? What values did we have to forsake to get that power? These are the kind of questions you have to ask yourself um, as we process these things. Yes, we have power, but do we have the type of power that advances the gospel in the way that the Bible talks about? These are the things that we need to process right now. Words and actions in Christ's name, driven by worldly power, don't represent the kingdom of God, regardless of how zealous they appear. In the end, regardless of how much uh, emphasis there is placed upon Christ in his name, Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you, to those people that are trying to represent Christ with worldly power. In order to represent Christ, we have to be packed, backed by kingdom power and kingdom authority. And the way we go about gaining kingdom authority is completely different than the way we go about gaining worldly authority, okay? Look at how Jesus attained his kingdom authority. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. This is how Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, went about attaining kingdom authority. Philippians 2.5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And look at what it's saying here. It's saying that Christ humbled himself, and he served mankind as a bondservant, and he even laid down his life for mankind. And in verse 9, it says, in response to this, for this reason, in verse 9, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself, he served mankind, he laid down his life, and in response to this, God exalted him. Christ himself gained his authority this way, and if Christ himself gained his authority, this, his kingdom authority this way, how much more do we also tap into kingdom authority this same way? Do you follow me? Not by struggling and striving with our fellow man, but by following the example of Christ and receiving the kingdom authority in faith. This explains why Jesus, at the beginning of his passion, when Peter was pulling out his sword and swinging around, why Jesus said this, put your sword back in its place. You know, Peter's there defending, defending the faith, you know, defending the cross. Jesus, or defending Jesus, I should say. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. 
Do you think I cannot call on my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen in this way? In other words, what's Jesus saying here? Kingdom power that transforms the world and breaks the curse that we're all under is unleashed much differently than world power. Very differently. And it's a way that the world despises, but it's still true. Representing Christ requires us to pursue kingdom power to carry out his commission. Not only are we called to represent him, but we're called to represent him in this way and with this authority and power. Then and only then does the world change and does the kingdom advance. When we try to do it with world power, all we do is bolster and strengthen the world and work against the kingdom of God, regardless of how much we say and chant his name. But there's one more telltale sign that involves how we identify ourselves with Christ, right? How do we embrace Christ's identity? Another obvious part of representing Christ is the act of identifying ourselves with him. And to be clear, Jesus was not shy about explaining our responsibility to do this. Um, This is Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Let's see if we can get her to go here. There it is. This is Jesus' words to his disciples. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. You see what he's saying there. Uh, You know, he's saying we have a clear responsibility to identify ourselves with Jesus. You know, there's no question. I think we all understand this again. We have a responsibility to identify and align ourselves with Christ in his kingdom. That's not in question. The real question is how do we go about doing it? How do we do it? Do we align ourselves with Christ's identity in his his kingdom by focusing our energies on displaying his symbols or focusing our energies on imitating his character? Again, how do we go about it? Do we display symbols or do we focus upon emulating his character? And again, the way we answer this question is really going to go a long way to teach us about how we are representing Christ. Um, There is an awful lot of emphasis upon displaying Christian symbols these days. Um, I think probably the news story that we're seeing right now, um, there's always going to be news stories about this, I think, but the one we're seeing right now is in Texas, where there is controversy over recent recent legislation passed which requires schools to display in God we trust in the, in prominent places uh, that's that's going on in Texas right now if you if you google in god we trust in Texas you can read more on what's going on there but that's the recent issue on the spotlight but in reality this emphasis upon symbols has been going on for as long as i can remember uh, i am 44 years old for as long i was brought up in an ev- evangelical church and in the culture and for as long as i can remember there has always been campaigning for prayer in schools and for the Ten Commandments to be in courthouses, and for things like In God We Trust to be prominently displayed in public places. And all along there has been this sense that these things in place strengthens Christian representation, and when these things are removed, it weakens Christian representation. However, in reality, does flying banners and Christian symbols actually advance the kingdom of God. And I'm just asking you to think about it for a second. Does the displaying of manners with, you know, I, I love Jesus and God we trust, you know, these guys, do these things actually advance the kingdom of God uh, and, and go distance to converting the hearts of men or not? Um, I, would, I would question that. And here's, my re- here's one of many reasons why. For the sake of time, I'm just going to give you one reason. Um, think about Christmas. Some of you are saying, "Don't let's not think about Christmas yet. Christmas is a bit early. You know, we, we're just now getting into October here, and we have Thanksgiving, but Christmas is coming." Okay, um, and every year, for as long as I can remember, uh, there has been four to six weeks that our entire nation, and in fact most of the world, has devoted to recognizing this holiday. And during that time, Christian hymns are sung and played on the radio. Bible stories are told everywhere. Christian symbolism is thrown all over the place. The entire culture is saturated with Christian symbolism during Christmas. Happens every year. What effect does it have on the kingdom of God in the hearts of men? Does it do anything to advance the kingdom of God at all? 
or does people, do people tend to be more um, carnal and debased during that time than any other time? I mean, have you ever been shopping on, on uh, what's that, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving? It's crazy, you know what I mean? And the symbolism is displayed the whole time, but the, the carnality is still there. And I would suggest to you, because this is because symbols do little to nothing to really advance God's kingdom. Um, this is why Jesus said, repeatedly that God honoring words and verbal displays of affection don't really count all that much to the overall kingdom mission. And this is why I'm going to put a passage of scripture that I read before up on the board. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father is the one who's going to enter. There's going to be lots of people saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. That doesn't mean anything. It's the ones who do his will the ones who imitate his character, those are the ones that are going to enter. What really matters in identifying with Christ is how much we emulate the character of Christ in our daily actions. I'm going to say that again. What really, really matters. If you really want to identify with him, if you really want to associate yourself with Christ, then you must emulate his character in your daily life, in your daily actions. Strive day by day to follow his example. And this is why Jesus says to his disciples in John 13, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Love one another. Listen to this, verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you hold up the banner, if you say, in God we trust, this is how they're going to know. Is that what it says? And no, it says, by you love one, your love for one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is, how you, this is how you tell. This is how you identify with me, not by symbols. In reality, <clears throat> displaying symbols of devotion to Christ can actually misrepresent Christ when our actions don't line up with our profession. Think about it. Not only do symbols not really do a whole lot to advance the kingdom of God, symbols in themselves aren't bad. I'm not saying take down your bumper stickers. I'm not trying to be all radical here. I'm just saying that doesn't really do a whole ton to advance the, the cause of Christ. But not only does it not do a whole ton anyway, when your actions don't line up with Christ, when you live contrary to him, and then you display his symbols prominently, you bring reproach and dishonor to his name, and you work against the kingdom of God. You misrepresent him. And that, folks, it's serious. There is a commandment, the third of commandment says, thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? And that's talking about more than just flippantly using his name in our speech, though it is talking about that some. It's talking about misrepresenting his name in the world. And we do that when we are throwing them symbols up all over the place and living like this world. With this in mind, we would do much better to channel our energy that we are using to identify with Christ on living like him and following his example and assimilating his character and put less energy into displaying his symbols. Not that his symbols in and of themselves aren't bad, but it really isn't going to make or break the kingdom of God whether symbols are displayed in public places and whether stickers are on our car. What really advances things is when his followers take his example seriously and they follow it. And when we do that, the world looks on and says, that person is truly a follower of Jesus Christ. Even though we don't have the symbol, they recognize it because of the way that we live. But again, when we live like this world, when we sow division and confusion and when we live in fear and when we do all the same stuff and, and live in sin and all the same stuff that the world does and then we plaster our symbols around, all we do is bring shame and reproach upon the name of Jesus Christ and we get in the way of progress. And so we bear the name of Christ. We sin when we fail in our job to represent him. We also sin though, perhaps even more so when we misrepresent Christ when we display his name in a way that brings reproach. And again, this violates the third commandment. And so my prayer is that the Lord would help us to represent him faithfully. And the way that we do that is to follow his example. And his example is what we're going to talk about right now through the partaking of communion. So if you would, uh, go ahead and grab the, uh, the elements now. I could have swore I brought one. Yes, I did. <laughs> 
Jesus gave this to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed as a way to remember him and what he did for us and what he was asking them to do in the world while they followed him and as a reminder that his kingdom is coming. All of these things are true and all of these things are part of this, this ordinance. And so as we partake, just remember what Christ has done for you. And I, I would encourage you now, let's just bow our heads. Remember what he's done and ask Christ to help you follow his example. Ask him to give you the power and the strength by the power of his spirit to be able to follow his example in this world. Let's bow our heads at this time. Father, your word says, greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And we know that your authority was unleashed on the world through your act of incredible, radical sacrifice. And it continues to be, and the gospel continues to be advanced as we sacrifice and place our faith and trust in you in the same way that Jesus did. Father, help us to be overwhelmed and inspired by the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us every day to strive to be just a little bit more like him, fully understanding that, fully understanding that we never are going to be perfect. We're never going to be like him in this life. But if we can just be a little bit more like him, Lord, it will help us to represent you well in this world. Help us to do that by the power of your word and your spirit. We thank you for sending Jesus. Amen. The scripture says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us partake together. And the scripture says that in the same manner he also took the cup after the supper. And he said to his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant which is in my blood shed for you. Drink ye this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake together. It is our job to show the Lord's death until he comes. Help us to do that. Amen. Will you stand together and sing with me? Will you stand together and sing with Holly, actually? <laughs> <laughs>